All right, let me open up this episode um, by making a simple statement. That statement is this. Jesus Christ is awesome. Now, if you were with us last time, you might remember, hey, this is how Steve opened up last episode. And that's correct. And uh, I wanted to open up again saying that this time because we're going to continue to look at that. Um, And so we're we're continuing our look um, at this whole thing of how worthy our God is. We've been looking at this um, from Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. We looked at chapter 4 a couple weeks ago. Uh, last week we looked at we looked at part of chapter five where we started looking at the worthiness of the lamb, um, and we're going to continue to look at that this time. And again, like I say this time, the same thing that I said last time or was was getting to last time is the fact that um, you know, and just looking at the lamb, who is Jesus Christ, um, we just see the 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 majesty and the power in this whole thing. Um, and just the authority that he holds and, and how that's going to relate to his role in um, in unleashing all the things that we see about and that we re- read about in the book of Revelation as it relates to um, his role in human history. Um, so we're looking at a God who's in control. We're looking at a God who has power and strength. We're looking at a God uh, who, uh, it, who, you know, has all things in his hands, who rules you know, you name it. I mean, we've looked at quite a bit of things um, over these last couple of weeks. And so we're going to continue to do so this time by finishing up Revelation chapter five, which is part of our longer study of the book of Revelation itself. So I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. All right, so I want to before we get to our text, I want to I want to do something here. I want to read a little short excerpt um, from a book uh, that I've had for years, and this is a book that I got. This was part of required reading uh, for when I was in seminary. Um, but the book is called Finding God, and it's by Larry Crabb. Um, this came to mind uh, really just today before coming into this time, and I felt led to get this off my shelf and to and to look it through, and then. Uh, to actually read it, um, uh, read it to you guys. Uh, again, this is by Larry Crabb. Larry Crabb um, actually just recently passed away. And by recently, I'm talking about um, within the last, I want to say week or so. I it, it may have, if it wasn't last Sunday, it was the Sunday before last, I believe, um, that Larry Crabb had, uh, had just uh, recently passed away. Um, so he is, he has gone on to be with the Lord. Um, and it's interesting, our, our, the person who taught our seminary, uh, years ago, um, knew Larry Crabb and had been mentored by him. And so, um, you know, we got a little bit of insight on Larry Crabb, the man, um, from him because, uh, they knew that he knew Larry Crabb, uh, pretty well. But, um, this is from his book, uh, Finding God. And I just want to read, uh, just a few paragraphs here, this, this, small excerpt here, um, which I think is pretty interesting. And this is something that has always stuck with me. Um, and especially with what we've been talking about in the book of Revelation over the past couple of weeks, um, I think that this is a, a fitting thing to consider. Uh, but it says here, uh, uh, and by the way, again, like I said, this is Finding God. This is um, from uh, Zondervan Publishing. And this was published back in uh, 1993. Um, but I think words that, that, uh, are still worth considering, obviously. Uh, but it says here, it says, um, um, it says here, as a result, we happily camp on biblical ideas that help us, uh, to feel loved and accepted. And we pass over scripture that calls us to higher ground. We twist wonderful truths about God's acceptance, his redeeming love and our new identity in Christ into a basis for honoring ourselves rather than seeing those truths for what they are the stunning revelation of a God gracious enough to love people who hated him, a God worthy to be honored above everyone and everything else. We have, we have learned to praise God the way that the way we tip, especially, uh, especially attentive waiter, good treatment. We expect, but exceptional treatment deserves special recognition. And certainly God qualifies for extra notice. He has gone to great trouble to feed our souls and boast, bolster our self-esteem. We therefore leave him a big tip, feeling benevolent, 
and noble, and he, in turn, beams with humble appreciation as he hears us say, well done, you have served us well. But this is backwards. We have uh, we have rearranged things so that God is now worthy of honor because he has honored us. Worthy is the lamb, we cried, not in response to his amazing grace, but because he has recovered what we value most, the ability to like ourselves. We now matter more than God. I just think about that and just think, is that true? I think that there's, it, w- it was true you know, when I read it for the first time several years ago, and I think to some degree, I think that's something that we still struggle with. And so we might be people who say God is worthy or the lamb is worthy to be praised because of, uh, because he's made us feel good about ourselves or he's bolstered our self-esteem or because he makes us feel good. And when we've looked at what we've seen thus far in places like revelation chapter four and chapter five, Uh, you get the sense that that's not really what it's all about. Now, of course, we can praise God for what he has done because we are expected to do that. And, you know, out of the deep appreciation that we have in our hearts for what he has done for us, it still leaves us with the reality that we are not the point. We are not the point. He is the point and he is the one who's worthy. And that's why I think it's very, it's very noteworthy. And we pointed this out a couple of weeks ago in chapter four, when we start unrolling some of these things, these praises that we see that are that are aimed at at the one who sits on the front at, on the throne and to the Lamb, specifically to the one who sits on the throne, who is God the Father, how things are started out is that he is he is worthy or that his his excellencies are uplifted because of who he is, and that's where it starts. That's where it begins. He's worthy already because of who he is. Um, and granted he is worthy because of also because of what he has done, but let's keep sight of the fact and hopefully our going through revelation four and five, um, has kind of pinned this to our hearts and minds is that in looking at all of this and talking about the fact that God is worthy, you know, it's about him and not about us. We're not the point. He is the point. And because he is the point, that's why he is worthy. Okay. And so let's keep that in mind. I, th- I thought that that was, uh, and again, that that's something that just came to mind today. And, you know, it, perhaps it was the Lord bringing that to my attention and wanting me to share that bit, um, from that book, uh, with you guys. Um, it's very well the, the possibility, but, um, but hopefully that's something that can, that we can, that you can mull over in your minds. But so we're going to finish up revelation chapter five today. And uh, again, this is this is part three um, in our in our whole look of the of the whole thing, looking at how God is worthy. Our our God is worthy. And we've seen that in chapter four as it relates to him who sits on the throne. And we saw that last week as it relates to the lamb, who is Jesus Christ, who also, of course, is God. Um, and specifically as it relates to the lamb, we're talking about the lamb who is worthy to take the scroll and open up its seals. Because uh, again, what we're dealing with here and what we looked at last time was in the right hand of, of the one who sits on the throne as a scroll that had writing on the uh, in, within and on the back, which kind of takes on the form of what looked to be at that time um, a legal document. And so the question was asked, who is worthy to to open the, sc- uh, open the scroll and to break its seals? And nobody anywhere in heaven and earth and under the earth and anything was worthy to open up the scroll. And so what we determine and what we talked about as far as the scroll and what and what it represents and what we will see it representing later on um, is the lamb's uh, unfolding of human history and bringing everything to its final conclusion leading up to um, the revelation of Jesus Christ, his second coming. So basically what we're seeing here is in, in all of this, let me just say this, it's all of this is in the uh, is in the um, with the idea that uh, that. God's people are vindicated in this present world in, in between the first, uh, the first and second comings of Christ as they themselves find themselves under intense pressure and persecution. Okay. And the fact, and remember the fact that this is, this is what we're dealing with. And this is what the, the, the general condition of the first century church, especially those churches in Asia minor, those things that they face it's it's helpful for them to get the heavenly perspective that they do through the eyes of the apostle john in revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5 the whole thing though is that 
with the scroll and which will reveal the contents of everything leading up to in uh, within history that leads up to the ultimate victory found in Christ when Christ comes back we have to have somebody who's who has authority to open up the scroll and to break the seals because that whole thing can, doesn't fall on just anybody with any sort of legal legal document back at that time that was sealed you couldn't have just anybody just open up the open up that scroll that's a big no no you had to have somebody who had authority to do that and so with this scroll that we see up in heaven that's in the hand of the of the one who sits on the throne the person who has the authority, the right authority to do that needs to be found to be able to do that. And John weeps because nobody was found to, who could open up the scroll. And so we, we get a sense that John understands the import of opening up the scroll and breaking the seals. And so what we talked about last time as it relates to that is the whole thing that, you know, uh, getting a heavenly perspective on things that God got God reigns and that he's in control in the here and now is very helpful to our hearts and minds for us here on earth and especially for the first century church um, at that time but what if there is no future hope of everything coming to its final conclusion where where final victory is finally secured sin and sinners are finally done away with and the new heavens and the new earth comes uh, comes into play what if what if none of that ever becomes a reality? And we're just stuck in this constant cycle of sin, 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 pressure, pressure, persecution, 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 all throughout this time. You know, that's a, you know, that, that sort of thinking is kind of, you know, kind of maybe grates on the heart a little bit. And I think that that's what captured John's emotions and what caused him to weep. But the good, but the good news is, is that one of the elders tells him not to weep anymore because the, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. That's in, that's in verse five of chapter five. And so what we see in the, in the, uh, in the following verses is the whole thing of the lamb, um, which we understand to be the sacrificial lamb. If all we're drawing all of this imagery from the old Testament and the sacrificial system and understanding that Jesus Christ himself is our Passover lamb. When John sees the lamb, what he's seeing is a representation of the son of God, Jesus Christ himself. And this lamb was standing as though uh, as though it had been slain. Now, remember, the slain part of it, you know, is, you know, features the whole thing of his of his redemptive work of his sacrifice on the cross. But notice that he's standing, which talks, which speaks to his resurrection from the dead, which is very significant as well. OK, which which shows all the more the, the power and the authority that that this lamb holds uh, because the grave couldn't hold him and he conquered sin and death through that. Okay. And so he is the one, okay, that takes the scroll from the, from the hand of the one who sits, sits on the throne. And where we left off last time in verse eight, where it says, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayer, uh, which are the prayers of the saints. Okay. And now when we get into verse nine, we get into what they, what they sang. And the praises that they that they that they offered to the lamb and just highlighting the fact that the lamb is worthy. So we see that he is worthy to take the scrolls. Now we're going to see why that is. OK, and much of what we have here, um, at least in verses nine and ten, uh, centers itself on the whole thing of, of the lamb's redemptive work. OK, um, and, and the after effects of that, the fact that he was slain and what resulted from that. Now, remember, again, what we're dealing with, we we're dealing with a lamb that was, yes, he was slain, but he was also one who was raised to life because the, the lamb that that John is seeing is a lamb that's standing. So put those two things together and then and then add into and add to that everything else that you see in verses nine and ten. Um, and you have a pretty, uh, you have a pretty glorious, uh, glorious thing there. Okay. So, um, you know what, let me, let me do this. Let me, uh, read the whole chapter again. I did that last time. I'm going to do that again this time. So again, we have the full picture. Um, but really we're going to, we're going to pick up where we left off in verse nine at, at verse nine and then finish off the chapter. But let me just read the chapter as a whole. Okay. So in verse one of chapter five, beginning there, it says, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, uh, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? 
And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that, no, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the, and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had, it, he had, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls which, uh, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Okay, so again, this just continues the theme of worship that we've seen in these two chapters, both in chapter four and here that what we've read in chapter five. Now, as we've seen before, and as we saw in the first part of this chapter, the, the lamb who was slain but is standing is worthy to take the scroll. And he takes the scroll from the right hand of him who sits who is seated on the throne. And so when he does that, the, 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 the 24 elders and the four living creatures, um, you know, take their positions um, of, of worship, you know, just realizing and recognizing um, the worthiness of the lamb to do this. Um, so again, as it said there in, in verse eight, after he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Okay. Uh, which is a, posi a position of worship. Okay. We've seen the 24 elders do this, uh, as well, uh, as well, you know, falling down before, uh, before the throne. This was, this was as it related to, to, to one who's, who sits on the throne, which we understand to be God, the father. Um, the one who shares that throne, it, the, the sense that you get is the, the, the lamb, um, you know, as we see him in this heavenly scene, the 24 elders and the four living creatures also do this. They fall down before him in worship. Okay. And in verse nine, it says, and they sang a new song. Okay. And so from that, from that song comes the whole thing of saying that, that the lamb is worthy. Now let's just pause just for a little bit here to talk about the fact that this is a new song. Okay, um, and you re you read about this in a few other a, a few places in the Old Testament as it relates to a singing of a of a new song. Um, in particular, you can go to places like Isaiah chapter forty two, um, and I'm thinking specifically um, of verses nine and ten, um, where it says where it says here, um, "Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare." Before they spring forth, I tell you, I, I tell you of them. Then verse 10, it says, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. You who, uh, you who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. So it's just interesting that you have a connection there between singing a new, a new song to what, uh, in verse 10 to what is, is uh, said previously before there. Um, with the, with what it says, it says, um, uh, behold, the former things have come to have come to pass and new things I now declare. Now, if we want to make a connection between new things and then a new song, uh, you know, in revelation, you know, one of the things that you can see is that what the lamb is doing. I mean, if we're looking at this from, from this whole thing of the lamb coming on the scene. And then what, what's going to follow is, is, a, is, a, is a rehearsal of, of talking about what he has done. You know, when Christ came on the scene and he died on the cross, that set into motion a new, a new uh, uh, moment in redemptive history uh, that, 
that kicks off all the more this this uh, this pathway, this road to things that leads to the end. And when I say new in that sense, we're not talking about a newly invented sort of thing here. This is something that has been on the mind of God in eternity past. So this isn't something this is isn't some sort of recent um, invention or innovation or something like that. But uh, in that in this form of human history with the lamb coming on the scene in human history, you see this new thing happening. Um, you know, that, that leads all the more further down the path to redemptive history that leads to the final victory when Christ comes back. Okay. Now back in uh, Isaiah 42, I just want to make another note here where it's uh, in verse eight, it, it says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. I want to want you to, to staple that whole thing of glory, not going to carved idols here. Um, staple that in your mind for the time being um, as I flip back to um, Psalm 96. And in Psalm 96, we see again this whole thing of a new song uh, being sung here. Um, and in Psalm 96, in verse, in verse 1 and following, it says, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to, sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. It's interesting. It's, it says tell of his, uh, his salvation. Now, obviously, it's not talking here in Psalm 96 about uh, salvation through Jesus Christ. I mean, but, you know, salvation could be seen in many different ways, in many different forms um, in the Old Testament. But obviously, when it, even in our time, when we're talking about salvation through Jesus Christ, that sort of thing can obviously apply. But it says tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Here it is. He is to be feared above all gods. For all gods of the peoples are worthless, are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. And, and then following that, it goes into, uh, you know, just all the other things that the Lord has done and how we are to ascribe to, uh, to the Lord uh, the glory that's due his name. Um, and so it's just interesting. And in both of those passages, it, you know, the, talking about singing, the, uh, singing to the Lord a new song and how what's implied there is that he's worthy of that praise in comparison to these other gods or false gods and these idols carved, carved images who are, that are worthless and they can't do anything. And so the fact that you're even here in Revelation chapter 5 dealing with a god uh, depicted is as the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb, our true Passover lamb, who is who is seen as slain, but is standing. That shows all the more the fact that he is worthy of praise and that he is God, and nobody else, no other god, no other idols, you know, no other invention um, of the human mind as it relates to um, different religions in the world can do what God, the true God and the true Lamb, has actually done. And so he is worthy and he is far above all these other gods. And so when it comes to this and his worthiness to take the scroll, he takes the scroll and the creatures, the 24 elders and the, and the living creatures fall down before him and they, say, and they sang a new song. Okay. Now, just one other thing that I want a note that I want to make before we move on. It says that they sang a new song. Um, and... Uh, from our past discussions, what, uh, one thing that I've said um, that I believe, that I lean more towards as it relates to the identity of the 24 elders and the four living creatures, I think those are two different descriptions um, of, an or of orders of angels um, that, uh, that, that praise and worship God and who have different functions as it relates to angelic duties that are given to them. The 24 elders representing uh, their, their representation of the people of God uh, who exist on the earth that, that are made up of, of people from both Testaments, both Old and New Testament. And then the four living creatures who are angelic uh, angelic beings that are connected to the judgment of God and, and unleashing the judgment of God according to his will. Um, and so I've identified them as angels. Now, again, people look at, at, at different things in Revelation in different ways, but uh, one of the things that I find that's common, uh, or at least I've heard more and more, um, as it relates to Revelation and even with sections like this, um, is that, you know, what you're dealing with, at least with the, you know, with, with the 24 elders or the living creatures, is that 
because it says they sang a new song, well, we can't be dealing with angels here because the belief is for a lot of people is that angels don't sing, um, which I don't know. Well, I know why people say it, but I don't know why they, they draw the conclusion um, that they do. And so because of that whole thing of where they say the angels don't sing, that, that affects the way that they, that they look at passages where these, where these creatures and these, and these elders and, and things show up. Um, and it, and it can very much, uh, affect the way that you interpret, uh, interpret certain passages of scripture. Um, but the thing is, is, and this is the reason I, I usually hear from people. They say that, you know, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that angels sing. Um, and my whole response to that is, so what, um, you know, that's just like somebody saying that the apostle Peter in the Bible, it never says anywhere in the Bible that, that the apostle Peter ever sang. So we make the conclusion that Peter never sang a song in his entire life. Well, of course that would be silly for me to say, right? And so I think that just because scripture doesn't say that angels, that angels sang doesn't mean that they, that they haven't and they can't, and they never will sing. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, I mentioned that, you know, just so that we are careful about certain things, um, and how we look at scripture and how we approach certain things. If these 24 elders and the four living creatures are representatives of angels, and obviously we can, we can honestly say that, that angels do sing from this one verse, you know, granted, we might not have a multitude of, of passages of scripture that say that angels sing, but why can't one be enough? Um, and why can't why can't we say that an- angels both say and sing? Because one of the things that is said is that angels are said to be saying things, but they never. Uh, but it's never said that they sing. And my whole thing is why can't it be both? Why can't it be both? And I think that it actually is both. Um, if we're dealing with angels who give who give uh, praise uh, to the testimony of who God is, um, I don't see why why my songs and music uh, can't be a part of that. And so I think that when you're when you're talking about the 24 elders and the and the uh, four uh, four living creatures, that these are angels that actually do sing, and that what they sing is is noteworthy because when it talks about uh, the the redemptive work of, of Jesus Christ in that passage, um, they don't they don't include themselves in the whole thing of um, of you've ransomed us, um, you know, and that sort of thing. Now there are there are there is a, a, a somewhat of a uh, I don't know what the right word to use is um, there there has there has been there have been manuscripts that have been found um, that would suggest that in this passage um, the the whole the uh, first person plural is used in this song and saying that you ransomed us or that you redeemed us that sort of thing. But looking at that, and, and even from the UBS fourth edition uh, Greek manuscript, um, they give an A rating to the, uh, which means that they're certain that that first person pro, uh, plural uh, pronoun of us um, is not part of the original, and that it is actually, um, you know, uh, it, it is actually accurate for when they sing and talk about people in the third person. And saying that this is what God, this is what God and this is what Christ has done for them. Okay, and if that's the case, then that would really point all the more to the fact that we're dealing with angels who are singing this song, because that seems appropriate that it would talk about what God has done for other people and not for themselves, since angel, since God did not redeem or ransom angels. Okay, and that would seem to make more sense of that. But enough said about that. We don't need to make a big issue of that. But as it says there in verse nine, it says that they sang a new song and they're saying, um, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why? For you were slain. So, you know, the, the whole thing of, of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, um, is very central to everything that's going on here. Um, and in fact, if we're talking about a scroll that, um, that is outlaying, uh, you know, God's purposes for, for human history, for his people and for people outside of his people. Um, You know, we come to understand that within that whole plan of human history, uh, one of the main features of that is his, uh, his death on the cross and what he has done for his people and purchasing his people. Cause he says right there, let's, let's go in further into what he says here. He says, for you were slain 
and by your blood you ransom people for God. Many other translations, um, instead of ransomed, use the use the word purchased. Okay, um, which is appropriate. We're we're talk, We think about places like uh, like Acts chapter twenty, where it talks about uh, God purchasing the church with His own blood. Okay. Um, you know, in places like First uh, um, Corinthians chapter six, where it says that we are not our own; we were bought with a price, and what a costly price that that is. The 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 blood of Jesus Christ Himself, the blood of the Lamb, um, is the purchase price that was used to ransom people like you and me, sinners who, as as Larry Crabb pointed out in the, in the excerpt that I read from you, people who hated Him first, right? Okay, and so we were not worthy of, of this of this amazing demonstration of mercy and grace that was that was laid out for us. Okay, so the lamb was slain, and because of that, and remember, not just slain, but risen from the dead, and that's why you have a lamb that's standing. Right. As a result of that, you know, it says that by your blood you you ransomed or purchased people for God. Now listen, from every tribe and language and people and nation, and what an amazing thing that is. Now let's try, let's, let's take some time here to look at this. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, as much as I can, and especially in places where it's important, let's do our best to look at this from, from the perspective of, of the original first century audience here. Because again, if we're dealing with a, a the first century church that that's under a lot of pressure and persecution, and again that we have churches that are under pressure and persecution even today, and that's been the case all throughout history. But think about this even from the first century perspective, where there's pressure and persecution because of their faith that they have in Jesus Christ. You know, discouragement could set in. Um, and especially if, if people are being persecuted because of the faith, you know, one might ask, what does this say about, about the pros- possibility or the probability of the word of the gospel spreading and people responding positively to it? I mean, it's hard to look at things, I would say, from an optimistic perspective if you're undergoing severe persecution for that very belief and the very message that you declare and that you preach, Right. So your world, as far as it relates to the Christian world and what you relate to and who you relate to can seem very small, very small. But we get, remember what we're dealing with here in chapters four and five is a, is a tremendous heavenly perspective perspective that's to give encouragement um, and joy and peace to, uh, to people on the earth who are going, who are going over the, uh, going through these things. So from an earthly perspective, things that, you know, they're experiencing a lot of pressure and persecution, but we get a heavenly perspective and we see that God is in control and that he has a plan for human history. And that plan involves salvation for people that he purchases. Yes, that would, and which would include those churches in the first century that would even, even include us today as believers in Christ in the 21st century, right? That we are a people that have been purchased by the blood of the lamb. But it's but it, it's it's something that is that is broad and it's widespread and then covers as it says there, every tr- from every tribe and language and people and nation, which tells me and would probably have told those people in the first century that even though you're going through those things right now, rest assured that part of God's victory through Jesus Christ is to bring people to salvation from every walk of life. You know, whether you're talking about from every culture, every language, every every people, every race, you know, that sort of thing. This is, you know, granted, you know, the the you know, the the way is narrow and few find it. But even with that few, you know, this is something that is spread throughout the whole world. And this is something rest assured that is going to that that is going to if it hasn't reached already every tongue, tribe, people and nation. So that what might look like defeat on earth from a heavenly perspective and knowing the knowing the plan of God. According to uh, according to the lamb is victory in the sense that people are redeemed from every tribe, tongue, people and nation. OK. And that's and that's and that's the perspective that it does, that's a good encouraging perspective that we can have, especially in, in, in a time when you if you ever feel that uh, you're under pressure or persecution because of because of your faith. Okay, so this was branches out everywhere, and this is a very meaningful thing that 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 
um, that the, ran- the, the makeup of the ransom people comes from all over the world. Okay, so even in our context, if we even think about uh, Christianity in the United States, um, I think it's 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 good for us to be reminded of the fact that Christianity is doesn't it doesn't exist only in the United States. Okay, you have Christians in South America, you have Christians in China, you have Christians in Sudan, you have Christians in Belgium, you have Christians in Thailand, you have Christians in Egypt, you have Christians all over the place, you have Christians in Japan, you have Christians in Australia, you have like I said, all over the place. Okay. And while for the most part, the world unleashes its assaults on Christianity and on Christians out of their hatred for Christ, that doesn't mean that the lamb is defeated and that he will not accomplish his purposes as it relates to reaching people to the utter ends of the earth. That much is true. Okay. And that's a demonstration of the fact that, that the lamb is truly worthy to take up the scroll because his control over history is evident in the fact that his of, of his purchase of his people and the work of salvation that works all throughout the world and purchasing people from all over to make up that people. OK, I hope that makes sense. I hope I'm describing that in a uh, in an adequate sort of way. OK, so he's worthy because he was slain and that by his blood, he ransomed or purchased people for God. And like I said, from every tribe and language and people and nation, now verse 10, um, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Okay. Now this reigning on the earth, this isn't anything that's that's intrinsic to us. This is something that's bestowed upon us, given to us from, from people who are actually in authority. And I just want to start there with the whole thing that they shall reign on the earth, because we've come across this before. You know, some people might think, some people say that this is a a present thing that's being talked about. Other people saying that, no, that this is something that's future. Um, You know, as it says there, it says, and they shall reign on the earth. I say both apply. Both most definitely apply. We've talked about this before in Revelation chapter 2 and in chapter 3, where it talks about um, us having the authority with, with Christ, just as he secured uh, the authority and, as, um, as, he, as he conquered and um, was taken up and, and, sit, and sits on the Father's throne. Okay, and, and just as Christ has that authority, so we also have that authority as well. We've seen that a couple of places again, like, like I said, in, in Revelation chapter 2 and in Revelation chapter 3. Okay, and I think that this here just, just speaks well to that. And that's something that we have in Christ Jesus as a result of being part of his people, right? Now, if you go back to the earlier part of that verse in verse, in, in verse 10, it says, and, uh, and, you have, uh, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. Now, this is, this is familiar in the book of Revelation in the sense that this is something that we saw in the beginning in Revelation chapter 1. Um, where it says uh, in the middle of verse four, uh, excuse me, verse five of chapter one and into verse six, it says to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Notice that. And then into verse six and made us a kingdom priest to his God and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So this is, we've seen this before in the book of Revelation back at the beginning in in chapter one. Here we're we're reminded of this again, that we have, uh, you have been, uh, you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God. Now I'll remind you, and I think I reminded you of this before when we went over this in chapter one, but this, that this is reminiscent of, of what you read about the Israelites in, um, in, uh, in Exodus chapter 19. And what you see in Exodus chapter 19 is this language is used to describe the people of Israel, that they are a kingdom and priest before God. Um, is that this was this was a priesthood that was supposed to um, that was supposed to communicate and testify to who God is to all the nations, because again, one of the things that is said about a priest, according to uh, Malachi two seven, is that they are to preserve uh, knowledge and instruction. Okay, and so that's that was the duty of the priest. And so if you put that in the context of Israel and to the people of Israel. They were, they were to preserve knowledge and instruction and communicate that and be a testimony to God to the other nations, okay? And that's what they were supposed to do. Now, unfortunately, they did a very bad job of it because, as it says, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. But as it relates to the church itself, 
the same language, the priest priest language and kingdom language that you that you read about um, uh, regarding the people of Israel, you you see um, attached to the description of the people of God in the church. Okay, and so you read that in places like First Peter chapter two, where it says that we are a royal priesthood, right? A holy nation, a people of God's possession. We belong to Him, right? We are His possession. We are His people. We are the people of God, and we are to uh, to proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out, of, uh, called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Notice there, we are to proclaim those things, right? That is what we are to proclaim. That's part of the duty that we have within this kingdom. And trust me, there, if there's a presence of a kingdom, then there's a presence of a king. That king is Jesus. That king is the lamb, right? He's ruling and reigning right now. And as it relates to the whole thing of, of kingship and ruling and reigning, remember what we saw last time when, the, when Jesus was described as the lion of the tribe of Judah and how that's a description of the of of the kingliness that we have, that that's uh, uh, that the Lamb possesses, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ possesses. Also, as as that description is laid out there of Him being uh, the root of David, right? All of that points to His His kingship, His messiahship, His rulership as King. Okay, and we are active participants in that kingdom, ruled by a King who is the lamb who was slain and is standing and who is worthy of taking the scroll and enacting everything in human history, the judgments, the salvations, and all of the things that make up uh, things between the first and second coming of Christ that leads up to that final victory. Okay. That's what we're dealing with there. So he's made us a kingdom and priests to our, uh, to our God. And, and we, or and as it says, they, or we can say we, because we're included in that, I would say shall reign on the earth okay and so that catalogs everything having to do with his uh, with his uh with his uh, with his sacrifice his redemption of us and the and the uh, and the benefits that we have as believers um because of that okay but remember it's it's this isn't about us primarily and solely um this is about him because again what we're focusing on is him as worthy he is worthy He's worthy of praise. He's worthy to take up the scroll and that sort of thing. Now, look at this. When you get into verse 11, it says, Then I looked. So John is, is continuing to describe here. He says, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. I remember years ago and I uh, in a Bible that I had, I was reading this chapter, and I came upon this verse. And I remember writing right next to that verse after I read that, writing with pen, wow, <laughs> wow, because what a scene this is. Now, uh, you know, obviously this isn't to give us any sort of indication of, a, of an exact number of how many angels there are. And again, this is another set of angels that we're seeing. This one, uh, of an innumerable uh, number of angels, along with the 24 elders and the four living creatures, it says myriads of myriads. Um, which again is, is a way of saying uh, innumerable. Um, the understanding from from the Greek and even the language I think might uh, might hint at this um, is that this would be the same as saying ten thousand by uh, ten thousand of ten thousand, um, and then and then after that as it says there and thousands of thousands. In other words, what we're saying here is that we're talking about a whole bunch of angels here, a whole bunch. Okay, so they've been added to this chorus that we're that we're that we're seeing that's being sung here in heaven. Okay, and so they're saying you go into verse twelve here, saying with a loud voice, "Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing." Okay, so again, the worthiness of the Lamb. Is uh, worthiness is ascribed to the lamb here, just as it was in verse nine. So twice we see this whole thing of worthy as the lamb uh, here in this chapter. Now remember, we've seen how worthiness is ascribed to him who sits on the throne in chapter four, which is God the Father. Twice we see worthiness ascribed to the lamb 
Um, one is to, uh, you know, once it talks about, you know, uh, he was worthy to, uh, he was worthy to take up the scroll because of his redemptive work. Again, we just finished looking at that in, in, uh, um, in verses nine and 10. And here, what we just read in verse 12, um, are, are several, uh, mentionings of his attributes here, um, that are worthy, that are worthy of praise. And that's really what we're dealing with here in this, in this part in verse 12, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy of what? I would say of praise and worthy, as it says, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. That speaks of worship and lifting him up. He's worthy to receive honor and glory and blessing. Those last three there, I want to note, um, especially there. Okay. Now, as you get into verse 13. So, by the way, understand here. Have you noticed, and I think I mentioned this before, that we would see this before, but you notice that the that the chorus that we've been that we've been seeing here in these two chapters has grown and grown and grown. Okay, we we've we've been introduced to the twenty four uh twenty four elders. We add to that the the four living creatures. Now we have a myriad of myriad and thousands of thousands of thousands of of angels who are joining the chorus in all of this ascribing worthiness to the lamb. Now, when we get to verse 13, it grows even bigger because it says there in verse 13, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. Okay, see how it's grown there? So we've gone, now we've gone 24 elders, four living creatures, myriad of myriad of angels, and now every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. So really, this covers all creation, okay, and all of and all that is in them. I, I skipped over that part. Sorry about that. Um, heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, and then we go into to the next uh, thing of praise there. But I want to point out here, again, I think that what we're dealing with here in this verse, verse thirteen, is is symbolic of of saying that. What we have here is all of creation, all of redeemed creation, I would say, that includes people and, and creatures even on earth uh, that, that ascribe glory to, uh, 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 ascribe glory here. And notice it's not, what we're going to see here is not just to the lamb, but it's to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb. So we've seen this being ascribed to the one who sits on the throne in chapter four. We've seen worthiness ascribed to the lamb twice in chapter five and now we have praise that's aimed both at at both the man the one who sits on the throne god the father and the lamb jesus christ and this is what they say and it says to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever okay and then we might as well cover verse 14 there and it, it says there um in verse 14 it says and the live and the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. Okay. So there again, listen, there again, in verse 14, you have the whole thing, the elders falling down uh, again and worshiping. This is, this is something, you know, uh, just from this vision, you're saying that these elders are getting quite an exercise, you know, up and down and, you know, falling before, falling before the one who sits on the throne, falling before the lamb, falling before both of them together. Okay. And it's talking about the worthiness of them. Now, what I think that we're dealing with, what we're possibly dealing with in verse 13 is the, um, is the praise that the, what, re, what we see there might be representative of the praise that, that takes place when human history is, all, is finally said and done and the final victory is finally secured. And so what you have there um, as it relates to every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them I think maybe what we're what we're dealing with there is is all redeemed creation at the end you know when that final victory is, is finally secured. So in other words, if we're looking at this from the from the from the perspective of the desire and the prayer that we have now uh your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've looked at much of what we've seen going on in heaven and I think with verse 13, 13, what we possibly might be seeing is the, the will of God on earth as it is in heaven finally being consummated and brought to final victory 
when Christ comes back. So really, I think in verse 13, what we might be looking at here is somewhat of a preview of that, okay? A little small taste of that. And again, the fact that this, uh, that this has grown to every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth um, and in the sea and all that is in them might give us a clue as to as to what we're dealing with here. Because again, the scene, much of what much of the scene that we've seen has been in heaven. Now all of a sudden we're having praise from, from creatures on earth. Now that doesn't mean that there are that there aren't redeemed people on earth that are praising God now. Obviously, we know that's not true. But again, if we're looking at this from the first century perspective, and if this is supposed to be uh, serve as an encouragement to the, the to the pressured and persecuted church, then giving them a preview of what is going to be what's going to be the case in the final victory when God's will on earth will finally be wrapped up and and made a reality as it is in heaven, we see that the plan of God is cer- is certainly going to is is certainly going to win the day. And so everything that they're that they're experiencing and going through right now is not the end of the story. And that's going to be an incredible, incredible, uh, you know, sense of encouragement for them. And it can serve as even as much of an encouragement to us today. Okay. And that's, I think, what we're dealing with there in verse 13. And also notice there that um, in the in the whole thing of uh, where it says there, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So again, all of that together be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. So all of those things together, uh, it, the lamb also receives in addition to the one on the throne, which which demonstrates all the more that the lamb, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is God. Okay? He is God. And you notice here um, that, uh, let's see, like it, the one who sits on the throne in verse 13, along with the lamb, obviously, receives uh, receives a blessing um, and honor and glory. Those are the last features that we see at the end of verse 12 when it's aimed right at the, uh, when that praise is aimed at the lamb of God himself, okay? And, back in verse 13, and might. And that's also uh, ascribed to the lamb in verse in verse uh, in verse twelve, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might, right? So all of this is you know all of this is is a demonstration of the fact that Jesus Christ is God. So really, that comes back to what we're talking about before. We, you know, remember what we've said and we've talked about. We're talking about our God is worthy, and when we're saying our God is worthy, we're not just talking about God the Father, but we're talking about God the Son as well. Because he's a, he's a central focus of, of, of these two chapters as well, particularly here in chapter 5. And so what we're dealing with here is God all around. Okay, God the Father, God the Son. We, we've mentioned the Spirit before in the sevenfold Spirit, right? His eyes range out throughout the whole earth, right? So really we've seen the Trinity, all the Trinity in this whole thing. And so when we get this heavenly perspective, we see God overall, who knows all things, who is, who is uh, completely strong and powerful and is worthy of praise and honor and glory because he is the one who reigns. He is the one who's in control. He is the one. He's the only one, if we're talking about the Lamb here, the only one who's been able to secure a people for himself, people who have been redeemed out of the slave market of sin and made to be a, a part of the people of God. And so as people who are part of that people of God and people of God who are persecuted, the execution of God's judgment against those people are it's aimed against people who have rejected Christ and as part of that rejection of Christ have gone against his people. And so all of this speaks to the future vindication of God's people fully and finally as that judgment is unleashed even now in human history between the first two comings of Christ and what will ultimately be the final victory when Christ comes back. And so all of this is supposed to be an encouragement. And I hope that it, that it is an encouragement to you. Listen, I've said a few times already that, you know, we try and look at this through first century eyes, but this is something that we can take home even for ourselves in the 21st century today. We can just look around us, especially as it relates to government and the crazy things that people are doing and saying and the things that they're espousing and things like that. We might think, man, man alive, God help us if this was all that we had to look forward to. 
and history just loops and loops with, with continued persecution and pressure and sinfulness and wickedness. But rest assured, take this home with you, friends, that we serve a God in heaven who has a plan. He's unfolding that plan, and he is worthy to unfold that plan because who we're dealing with ultimately is God himself, God who reigns, he's in control, he's sovereign, he has a plan, and in the end, he wins, okay? That's the theme that you're going to keep coming up over and over again in the book of Revelation, okay? And I think it's important for us to have that have the perspective that I've been talking about before and how to interpret the book of Revelation and seeing that this isn't just a, a, a book that catalogs things that happen right before the second coming of Christ. The, the topic of the second coming of Christ and things that happen before then, there are, there are features to that, but that's certainly not the only thing. And so there's a lot of things in the book of Revelation that speak very well to us in the here and now in the 21st century, as it did to the people in the first century. And I want you to be mindful of that. And one of the themes that you're going to continue to see is that God, Jesus Christ, is the winner. And we are going to see, ladies and gentlemen, the victory of the Lamb over sin, death, and, you know, and vindication for his people, all of that has been secured by the blood of Jesus Christ, and it's going to come to its full completion at the end. And so because we are his people and we belong to him, as I've mentioned before, we are on the winning side. And that should be an encouragement to all of us. And I hope that it is an encouragement to you. So, as we leave chapter five behind and as we as we get ready to go into chapter six, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be introduced to a preview, I guess, so to speak, of, of, the, of those judgments that are unleashed. And again, what I think what we're going to see when we when we finally see the lamb start to break the seals and to open up the scroll, we see a preview of the of the judgment of God and the things that happen according to his plan, uh, you know, just kind of a condensed preview of the things that we see between Christ's first and second coming. Now, I know that I realize that as I say that, that might make people's eyebrows raise a little bit because for a lot of people, what they see in the breaking of the seals in Revelation chapter six, because this is what they've been taught, is that this is uh, that this is the uh, the outworkings of God as it relates to the seven year tribulation. But stay with me on this. We're going to take uh, some we- a few weeks to look at this, and hopefully, I'll be able to demonstrate somewhat um, why this is this is cataloging more of things that we see um, in human history between the first two, se- uh, the first and the second coming of Christ, and not so much to a seven-year tribulation. Um, I would encourage you to stay with me on that. Um, so that we can, you know, just kind of delve into some of these things. A lot of those, these things can be confusing. Um, hopefully I can do the best that I can to bring some clarity to this whole thing. So I'll leave you with that and hope that you come back as we, as we start to look at, um, chapter six for next time. Okay. So we will leave it there for now. Okay. If you enjoy this show and you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple podcasts. You can also do so on iHeartRadio, YouTube, and on Spotify. You can also follow Loving the Scriptures on Twitter. The handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S E R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. All right, friends, it was a great, um, it was great, uh, you know, just uh, having this time and, and looking through this. This has been a good few weeks, actually. Um, that we've been able that we've been able to look at the worthiness of our God, and I hope that that's encouraged you, and I hope that that's given you a little bit of of a perspective of 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 the whole area of worship, and who we worship, and why we worship, and how we should worship the way that we should. Remember what I said at the very beginning of this time: it's not about us, it's not about you, and it's not about me. Okay, it's about God Himself, and He definitely is worthy of our of our praise and he is worthy of honor and might and power and all those things that are cataloged in the text that we looked at today definitely definitely true okay so my name is steve gill and i will see you right back here next time bye now